about enrollment. I have given instructions that everybody on the waiting list is to be admitted. And they can only do that up to the uh, last four. So there's four survivors on the waiting list. Uh, but I think uh, that I should be able to smuggle you in, uh, particularly when the first paper is due in about a week's time. We'll usually get some fallout when people discover they actually have to produce some work. Uh, so uh, on, <clears throat> unless you're the bottom four of the waiting list, you will be, at, uh, as of now, you should be admitted to the course. And the bottom four, I think I can get in as, it's not a promise, but it's a reasonable prediction as time goes on. Do you want to have a seat? Oh, you ran out of papers. That's great. All right. Uh, this is a big argument we have in my office. Uh, my wonderful assistant is obsessed about the environment. And she got <laughs> terribly worried that we had 50 papers left over. Uh, and she thought this was just a disaster. She could hear the trees falling in the forest. So this time she only produced, well, uh, not enough to go around. I will put the damn thing on uh, B space, uh, and then when we read it aloud, you will have a chance to get to know your next door neighbor very well. So take advantage of the opportunity, because uh, you may have to look on with somebody. Okay, thanks to you guys for handing it out. All right, uh, well, I'm not gonna talk about it for a few minutes anyway. All right, now let's remind ourselves where we are. We're struggling with the first half of the course, which is essentially about what most people think uh, the philosophy of mind is about. It's, uh, essentially, it's about the mind-body problem. That's the main source of worry. Uh, but there are other aspects to that, uh, such as uh, the problem of other minds, uh, the problem of freedom of the will, and, and in short, Descartes' set of problems. Uh, I think much more interesting question is how does the mind function as a biological phenomenon in a certain sort of system where the essential character of that biological phenomenon is consciousness. And consciousness is the one issue that continues to obsess people in mainstream uh, philosophy of mind. Why? Well, because the materialist tradition just can't cope with it. They think you know, there can't be such a thing. We know from physics that the world is all material. So there must be some kind of an illusion about consciousness. And then there are various ways of trying to cope with it. And you know uh, those uh, the ways now. They are behaviorism, uh, type, type identity, token, token identity, theory, uh, functionalism. And then ultimately the most um, uh, uh, fashionable and powerful version of materialism was strong artificial intelligence. It says, well, really, all there is there is a computer program. If you have the right uh, program, you've got a mind. And this also then has enormous implications uh, for uh, the rest of not just philosophy, but psychology and cognitive science. Because now, not only does strong AI give us a solution to the traditional philosophical problem, it gives us a research project, and a research project which enables us to make breakthroughs in the study of the mind, which are unlike anything that have happened in the past 2,500 years. And the basic idea is, all you need now to get a theory of the mind is to get a computer program which will pass the Turing test and which you have independent evidence uh, to show is like the programs that are operating in actual human brains. So strong AI gives us not just the creation of a mind, but it gives us a theory of how the human mind works because the program is itself a theory of the cognitive capacities that the human being is uh, exhibiting when he, when he or she implements that program in solving some cognitive task. I'm sorry that sentence was so goddamn long, but anyway, it's that time of day when I'm still not fully awake. Uh, all right, I want everybody to get that, that there is a, a terrific uh, importance uh, to strong AI, and I think that's one of the reasons why it was so appealing. I mean, to put it very crudely, to have a theory of the human mind, you don't have to know how the brain works. And since we don't know how the brain works, that seems wonderful. We can get a theory of the mind just by designing programs and then get, getting the uh, 
a computer uh, to uh, implementing the program to pass the Turing test. And then you have to have another uh, step, and that is you need some evidence that, well, the program that the human beings are doing is like uh, the uh, program that the computer is implementing. I'm going to give you a typical example of that. These are sort of Mickey Mouse experiments, and it's hard to believe that psychologists take them so seriously, but some people do. Uh, you get people, to, you get them, uh, uh, give them a list of numbers, uh, a 13, uh, a 3, a 7, a 24, and 6. And then you ask the people, was the number seven on that list, you see? And all of your computers, all of you computers, will uh, correctly answer yes. I mean, there may be some people that are still turned off, you know, because they had a late breakfast. Uh, they will say, yes, the number seven was on the list. Well then, okay, now they, the hypothesis is uh, that there's a simple lookup program whereby you go through the list. And that would predict then that if you had a, a longer list, it would take longer to identify the number seven on the list, even though it may have occurred at the same place on the list. And sure enough, the psychological experiments show that it does take longer if the list is longer. So that proves, or at least it's good evidence, uh, that the humans are using the same program that the computer uses. Now, does that seem to you a rather trivial result? It seems a rather trivial result to me, but I can tell you there was a period when people became famous uh, in uh, psychology for doing uh, precisely experiments like that. I won't tell you the names of the famous guys. Uh, you can look them up for yourself. Okay, so it gave us a research project. Uh, <clears throat> now, why did the Chinese room argument have such a, an impact? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is I never mentioned consciousness. You see, in the, in the thing that you read, uh, in the thing that's in the reader, uh, the original article in Minds, Brains, and Science, it was all about intentionality. And uh, the e existing attacks on functionalism, like Nagel's famous attack, or Frank Jackson's What Mary Knew, all of those relied on consciousness. And in those days, consciousness was not regarded as a legitimate subject. Uh, for a scientific study. It was regarded as something kind of mystical or touchy-feely or Californian. Or it wasn't. Uh, serious intellectuals uh, didn't mention consciousness. It was, like, it was as if I, you talked about mystical insight or something like that. If I said, well, uh, uh, the computer won't give us mystical insights. Well, nobody cares about mystical insights. They're not part of science. And in the early days of cognitive science, I used to go to these annual conventions <laughs> And I would tell them, we got to be interested in consciousness. There has to be a cognitive science project on consciousness. Watch the graduate students, because they're busy trying to become attuned to the mores of the discipline. They want to know how you're what you're supposed to cheer at and what you're supposed to throw up at. Whenever I mention consciousness, the graduate students will look at the ceiling, oh God, there he goes again, consciousness. It was not regarded as a legitimate subject. Now we're, now we're talking, this was, I'm amazed to say it, this is before any of you were born, for God's sake. This was in the 1980s. Maybe there are a few gray beards out there that existed in the 1980s. But in those days, consciousness was not regarded as a legitimate subject. On the other hand, intentionality was. And intentionality had a scientific name. It was called information processing. And so here I was hitting them right in the, well, I don't want to use these uh, uh, physical metaphors, but I was hitting them, so to speak, I, I, in the soft spot in their theory uh, because I said, Dude, I'm not talking about consciousness. We'll leave consciousness on one side. Just think about intentionality. Think about uh, the uh, mental content, the uh, semantic content that goes with a manipulation of symbols, and you'll see that's something that's left out of the computer program. The program is strictly a device for manipulating symbols. That's not a weakness of the program. That's the power of the program. The pocket calculator you have doesn't have to worry about, oh my god, I hope he doesn't give me long division this time, you know, um, because it doesn't know from long division. It just shuffles 
uh, symbols. In fact, it doesn't really do that. It's just an electronic circuit. I'll tell you about that difference in a minute. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, the power of the computer is precisely what made it fail as a theory of human cognition. Namely, it has no semantics. Now, that will seem puzzling if you've ever programmed, done programs in AI, because it usually comes a step in the program if you're doing natural language understanding when they ask you to program in the semantics. But what they give you is more symbols. Uh, uh, that is, you get a, a set of uh, interpretations of a string of symbols, and what you get for the interpretation is another string of symbols. So I think one of the reasons that the, the uh, argument had the effect that it did uh, is precisely that it did not appeal uh, to consciousness. Now, later on, it seems to me, of course, you make the same argument. The Chinese were arguing about consciousness uh, there in the Chinese room. I, I'm shuffling the symbols and I'm answering all the questions correctly, but I'm not conscious of any meanings attaching to these symbols. They're just formal symbols. Okay, last time I went through uh, some of the uh, arguments against uh, the Chinese room and uh, uh, it kind of got out of hand. I see I published this in a journal called Behavioral and Brain Sciences and that's kind of fun, but I had to respond to 27 simultaneous published attacks. I mean, there were one or two guys, I don't know how they got in, who were kind of friendly, but most of them were pretty negative, and you have to answer all these guys, and it's a bit like standing there with a whole lot of incoming missiles, and you got to shoot them all down simultaneously. Anyway, I did it. Uh, and then there were a whole lot of other uh, attacks, but that was the original. And I think by now there must be at least 200 published attacks on the Chinese room. And you can uh, go on to Google and find them. I, I only know the ones in English, but they're in uh, lots of other languages. Uh, but in any case, I don't think, I, I mean, if there's one thing I'm pretty confident about is uh, that this argument is not going to fail precisely because it rests on a logical truth, namely uh, that the syntax of the computer program is not sufficient for any kind of semantics, that the formal symbols are one thing, uh, the meaning or the content or the understanding that goes to, with the formal symbols, that's something else. And that's precisely what the argument rests on. It says you can have as much syntax as you want, but you still don't get semantics or understanding. Okay, now what are the long-term implications of this? Well, that's what I now want to turn to. Uh, and let's stop for questions. I'm going to talk about some uh, further uh, developments from these ideas. Yes? Uh, they agreed with me uh, that intentionality was the capacity of the mind uh, to represent objects and states of affairs in the world. Uh, the name that they gave for it was information processing, uh, but that nobody had any doubts uh, that um, uh, computers did information processing. That's what we designed them for, was to do information processing. And furthermore, they had no doubt that cognitive science, which was then a new discipline, was a science of information processing. And it seemed to people in those days that it was a great advantage of cognitive science. It's hard to remember that it was a brand new discipline in those days. I, 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 that it, uh, the, a brand new discipline of cognitive science had an advantage over behaviorism because behaviorism had no way to get inside the black box, to get inside uh, the brain, whereas the cognitive scientists did. And it looked like, yes, at last we have a science of the mind because we know what the mind is. It's a computer program or maybe a set of computer programs. So uh, people didn't quarrel with me about the definition of intentionality. In fact, that was a period in philosophy where people weren't too worried about definitions as long as you had a, a, could give some a, a clear application of the term. And information processing seemed like uh, it was a perfectly legitimate notion. Now, in a way it is, but there is a tremendous ambiguity in the notion of information processing and that's the ambiguity between the literal sense in which I do information processing uh, when I figure out the way to San Jose 
yeah, you go down the highway and so on. I, I, I'm, I'm doing information processing now. Uh, but if I, I turn on my GPS and ask it the way to San Jose, well, it will give me a set of instructions. But the information processing there is all observer relative. The electronic system doesn't know anything about intentionality. It just has a series of, of uh, uh, state transitions that it will go through until it prints out the directions about how to get there. So does cognitive science do information processing? Study it? Absolutely. Does a computer do information processing? Yes, that's why we designed it. But there's an ambiguity in the notion of information processing. There's the intrinsic information processing that actually goes on in the human brain when you're thinking about something, where you actually have intentionality. And then there is the observer relative or derived information processing that we get in computers. Now, this is going to be a very important uh, idea later on between what is observer relative and what is observer independent, where it doesn't matter what people on the outside think. And that is related to a crucial distinction between what you could call original intentionality, or original information processing, and the derived intentionality, which is observer relative, the derived intentionality when we attach meaning to something that is not intrinsically meaningful. Uh, let me give you some examples to illustrate this point. If I now have the, uh, the thought, it's raining, then that's a case of intentionality which is original. The French sentence, il pleut, also has that same content. It means it's raining. But the French sentence doesn't have that in any original or intrinsic way. It's just that we have used it. We have, I, I, by convention, treated that sentence as having a certain meaning. French speakers attach intentionality to that sentence, so it has derived intentionality. The intentionality of the sentence is all observer relative. It's relative to an outside interpreter. It's kind of an obvious point. But, but it's crucial for this investigation because if you ask the question, does the pocket calculator do addition and subtraction? The answer is, of course, that's what we designed it for. Does it do it by way of intrinsic or original intentionality? No, none, none of that. It's all in the eye of the beholder. It's all in the interpretation. What the pocket calculator is, is an electronic circuit, and we programmed it so that we can use it I, uh, to support our intentionality, but it has no intrinsic intentionality. It's all observer relative. In the early days, it was kind of fun. Uh, you would take, in the early days of pocket calculators, uh, take 10, divide by 3, and you'd get the 3, 3, 3, 3 uh, sequence that you're all familiar with. Then multiply by 3, and it wouldn't give you 10. It would give you 9, 9, 9, 9, 9. Yeah, yeah, uh, so you play a little trick on it. Now they figured out, oh, the great geniuses who program these things, a, a good pocket calculator today, you can test yours. Uh, we'll come back with 10. If you divide by 3 and then multiply uh, by 3, it should come back with 10. But uh, uh, in the early days, they couldn't do that. Uh, okay, so uh, these are essential uh, distinctions, but you'd be, I mean, once you, once you say, look, there's an obvious distinction between the original intentionality in my brain and the intentionality uh, in the sentence or the intentionality in the computer, it's kind of obvious, uh, but it wasn't obvious at the time, and people had made this systematic confusion. Why? Why did they make so many dumb mistakes? Well, I think there was a weird combination uh, uh, in the history of philosophy uh, that they were uh, exhibiting. On the one hand, they had a horrible fear of Cartesianism. They did not want to accept any intrinsic mental phenomena. They didn't want any spirits or ghosts or minds or, or uh, lurking in the brain. So there was anti a Cartesian, but at the same time, they didn't think of the brain as an actual biological organ like the stomach. 
they thought it did that the mind was something abstract and formal. And many of them actually said that. I mean, Dennett published a, a piece where he said the mind is, is an abstract phenomenon. It's a formal uh, a phenomenon. Uh, it's not like digestion. And that's straight Cartesianism. So there was a kind of survival of a sort of dualism in strong AI. I, as well as a resistance uh, to dualism. Officially, they were materialists, but in fact, they didn't I think of the mind as I think of it. It's a biological phenomenon. Uh, consciousness is like digestion or growth or photosynthesis or any other biological phenomenon. We'll get to that. I hope we get there this morning. Uh, okay, uh, now then, though, there is a weaker version, and you might think, well, that's, that avoids uh, the problems of the Chinese room. And I've called that cognitivism. So I'm, that's the next uh, topic for today's lecture. I'm going to explain cognitivism. Uh, those of you who keep notes, bless you. There must be at least all three of you. Write down cognitivism. That's the next heading. But first of all, I see some hands up. So let's take questions. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you briefly go back over original Yes, OK. Uh, this is going to be very crucial for the rest of the course. So let me, I'm glad you asked the question. Let me get it absolutely clear. When I say the sentence il pleut means it's raining, I am describing truly the intentionality of that sentence. It has a, a content. Uh, it has uh, conditions of satisfaction. You're going to hear more about them later on. Uh, it's about something. It's about the weather. But the sentence only has that because we think about it in a certain way. The sentence is intentional because it has derived intentionality. Whereas if I actually have the thought, oh my god, it's raining, that is actually an intrinsic or original thought, original intentionality. So you have to distinguish between the original intentionality in human and animal brains and the derived intentionality, where we impose intentionality on objects and states of affairs in the world, such as marks on blackboard. I mean, I, 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 these little fragments of, I guess it was probably calcium, isn't it? This piece of chalk. Uh, these fragments of calcium on the blackboard have no intrinsic intentionality, but we have, you all know English, so you're able to interpret the intentionality. That is derived intentionality. Okay. Now, that's a special case of a much bigger distinction, which we're going to have to get clear about in the uh, uh, philosophy of mind, between those phenomena in the world that have an existence independently of what anybody thinks and those that have an existence only relative to some uh, observers or some other people with intentionality. So for example, there's a guy who is president of the United States. But his being president of the United States is not like his, let's say, weighing 180 pounds, because his weighing 180 pounds is independent of any observers. But he's president of the United States only because we think he is, only because we have accepted an institution and a set of relations. And he stands in a certain position in that institution and those relations. To take my favorite example, I carry these sorted pieces of paper around in my wallet. And physically speaking, and as far as the observer independent features are concerned, it's rather trivial. It's uh, cellulose fibers with ink stains. But it's interesting to us because it's money. Now, the fact that it's money is not a fact of the physics or the chemistry. You can't tear it apart physically or chemically and figure and find out that it's uh, money, it's being money is observer relative. It's only money because we think it's money. That money is created by uh, communities, by collective intentionality. Roughly speaking, the natural sciences are about observer independent phenomena. Molecules, uh, uh, galaxies, planets, tectonic plates, all of those have an existence which is observer independent. When all observers die, as we all will, uh, hydrogen atoms will still have one electron. The hydrogen atoms and their electrons don't give a damn about us. We can all pass away, and they will still chug along merrily, eat one electron to each hydrogen atom. 
Okay, but when it comes to the social sciences, they are largely about observer relative phenomena. They're about governments, private property, marriage, uh, uh, social classes, elections, political parties. That's roughly speaking. So the social sciences deal with observer relative phenomena, stuff created by humans, and the natural sciences deal with observer independent phenomena. As usual, psychology straddles. Psychology deals with both. Incidentally, one of the reasons we're now in a great crisis is that the economists f f forgot that they're dealing with an observer relative human creation. They started to treat the equations as if they were like the equations of physics. And I know when I studied economics, that was a long time ago, already uh, they treated economics as if it were a natural science. So we learned that S equals I. Uh, uh, we learned that S equals I. The way in physics we learned that uh, force equals mass times acceleration. These are just laws of the, of the system. Savings equals investment, the way uh, uh, force equals mass times acceleration. And indeed, uh, they loved, the, even those days, they loved the mathematics. And you could draw the diagram where the demand curve and the supply curve intersected. And everybody felt the beauty of it was just overwhelming, that the marginal cost equals the marginal revenue. Uh, and, and that was the equilibrium that we were all happy. If you've never studied economics, you can go to sleep for the next 30 seconds while I wax eloquent on this. Uh, but what they forgot is, it's all a human creation. And the moment uh, people start living, uh, start, uh, the moment people stop believing uh, in the value of the derivatives, so no longer do they have the force that produces the mass uh, times the acceleration. Uh, they began to treat the equations as if they talked about the real world in a, in a fashion that was observer independent, whereas it's all a human creation, it's all observer relative. Uh, okay, so I'm glad you asked that question. You're going to hear more about this when we get into intentionality. Okay, other questions. Now, I want everybody up with this because I'm now going to raise a new topic. I promised you, cognitivism. <clears throat> Let's suppose uh, that I'm right, uh, that syntax is not the same as semantics. Uh, that once you have a syntactical system, you so far don't have any semantics. And you've still got to answer the question, where does the semantics come from? What does it do? Now, in the early days, in the, in the uh, let's say, uh, 30 years ago, in the early days of this argument, a lot of people in cognitive science agreed with me about that. They thought, okay, you're right. The syntax by itself isn't sufficient for the semantics. All the same, if you get the syntax right and you get the initial attachment of the semantics to the syntax right, you can forget about the semantics. The brain is a syntactical engine. And hence, we can study the computer programs that are going on in the brain, the programs that enable us uh, to identify the shape of an object from its shape, from its uh, shading, let's say, or that identify, that enable us uh, to, to uh, understand the grammatical structure of an English sentence. And it's true, there is a semantics, but the the semantics doesn't do any work. And the, this was often put by saying, the brain is a syntactical engine. The brain is an engine that takes formal symbols and manipulates them. And thus, we can still do a computational cognitive science, even if the Chinese room argument is right, that, you don't, that the semantics uh, doesn't come with the syntax, that you have to add semantics. All the same, we know from proof theory that if you get the attachment of the semantics right at the, to the syntax at the beginning of this, of this algorithm, at the beginning of the implementation of the algorithm, then if you got the right semantics in at the beginning, you will get the right semantics out at the end. And the steps in between are all syntactical. So what the brain does is syntax. The brain does is, is really a computer, and it does syntactical information processing. And the semantics doesn't do any work. It goes along for the ride. Now, I gave you a brief Mickey Mouse uh, illustration of that, and I want to repeat it because I'm not sure everybody understood it. If you take a, a, a logically valid argument stated in ordinary English, 
uh, you rely on the meanings of the words. Uh, so if I say, uh, if it rains, the ground will be wet. And then I say, it is raining. And I conclude, therefore, the ground is wet. <clears throat> okay, now that's a piece of ordinary English, and you have to have quite a lot of sophistication to understand it. So, for example, uh, here you have rains, and here you have is raining. You have this present continuous. Here you have will be wet, and here you have is wet. But your English is good enough. You understand the semantics of that so that you will see, well, that's Right, if it rains, the ground will be wet. It is raining, so the ground is wet. Now, you understand that is a valid argument. Now, get rid of the semantics and just treat it as a bunch of symbols. There are two steps. The first step was taken by Aristotle. And Aristotle is one of the stunning geniuses in all history. Uh, and for about a thousand years, uh, his conception of things was dominant. It's hard to believe anybody having the influence that Aristotle had. And part of what Descartes was doing was breaking out of the Aristotelian influence. Uh, most of us today can't understand the doctrine of substantial forms. I can't. I mean, what does it mean to say uh, the, uh, the soul is the form of the body? But anyway, Aristotle was very influential. And by the way, the textbook authors had the dream of every textbook author. Philip of Spain wrote a logic textbook that was standardly used in European universities for 400 years. Think of that. Uh, I mean, I, unfortunately, he wasn't around to collect the royalties. Uh, but still, it is a prodigious uh, run for a textbook. OK, I'm getting uh, uh, any, anyway, back to the subject. Aristotle saw uh, you can get rid of this particular semantics and just say, if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. Now, notice what you've done. You've kept some English. You kept if and then. And you have a, an implicit and, because this is uh, one and two, you have to understand. One and two. And then you've also kept a therefore, these three lines. So there is uh, some English left over in the Aristotelian system, all and some and so on. The next step is get rid of the if and the then and the therefore and the and, and just program your computer so that when it gets symbols that look like this and, and that, if it gets that pattern, it has an instruction, print out a symbol that looks like that. Now watch what happened in that case. We started off with a bunch of English sentences. We see that it's a valid argument because we understand the sentences. That's all semantics. We kept a crucial part of the semantics when we went to formal logic. We kept the semantics of if, and then, and and, and therefore. And then it became formal because it turns out it'll apply to anything. It isn't just about the rain, but it can be about Socrates being mortal or any of the other stock examples in the history of logic. But then we made a crucial move, get rid of the semantics altogether, and just have a set of formal symbols and rules that operate on the symbols. So you have a machine that's programmed. When it sees that string followed by that string, it prints out that string. Now, that is a purely syntactical operation. Any computer can do that. Indeed, what the computer can do is literally millions of steps like that in uh, virtually no time at all. In a few seconds, uh, it can go through extremely complex logical derivations. But it's all based on the fact that you can take the semantics, map it on to the syntax, and then forget about the semantics and just let the syntax do the work. Now, that's what these guys meant when they said, the brain is a syntactical English, a, 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 engine. Now, maybe Searle's right, let him get, but with his Chinese room and all that intentionality and all that, who cares? What we're interested in is science, and the science of cognition will treat the brain as a syntactical engine. And it's true you got to get the semantics right when you plug it in. You have to know what to plug in here 
for a P arrow Q and P, uh, but if you do that right, then you'll get the semantics right at the end. Semantics goes along for the ride. The real work is done by syntax. Now, just to have a name, I call that cognitivism. I, I, I just I needed a label for that to distinguish it from computer functionalism or strong AI. So I, this is kind of my name for this, and not everybody uses cognitivism the same way. Cognitivism enables the computational theory of the mind to continue even though the syntax of the computational model is not sufficient for the semantics of actual human understanding. So you can accept the Chinese room and still accept the computational theory of the mind just by saying the, mind is a, the brain is a syntactical engine and actual mental processes are syntactical computational processes operating over the syntactical or formal structure of mental states. Is there a semantics in there? Of course. We're not denying that there is a semantics. It just doesn't do any work. The work is actually done by the formal symbol manipulations. And we know from proof theory that anything you can do with a semantics, you can do with a syntax up to a, 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 a very oddball limiting case, and that's Gödel's theorem, where you have I, I, I statements in a, in a mathematical system that you can see are true, even though they're not theorems. You can't prove them. But basically, proof theory will enable, with these oddball exceptions, proof theory will enable you to do anything. And proof theory is the, is the theory of how you get results by operating on, on the syntax, just like uh, just as I did in that case. So I want people to appreciate the power of that. Now, that's not going to work either, but that's a more interesting argument why it doesn't work. So let me tell you what we've done so far. I have refuted a strong uh, AI, or so I uh, think. You will have a chance to, def to defend it on uh, term papers, exams, uh, and, all, and in class if you want to defend it right now. Okay, let's suppose I've refuted strong AI. What happens to the computational theory of the mind? Well, it can't do quite what it wanted to do, but it can do an awful lot, according to this view, because it says, even if the syntax of the computer program isn't sufficient for having a mind, it is at least necessary, and it's crucially important because mental processes are, without exception, computational processes operating over the syntax or formal symbolic structure of mental states, and the brain is a system that works by operate, as like any other computer, by operating on the syntax. How, how can that work? Why don't you need the semantics? And the answer is we know from proof theory that if you get the attachment of the semantics to the syntax right, anything you can do with the semantics, you can do with the syntax. Uh, this was uh, I, this was the implication of the idea of Turing machine uh, and the idea of the church Turing thesis. Any algorithm at all can be implemented on a Turing machine, can be implemented on a system that uses only syntactical objects. And that meant we could still do cognitive science computationally. We could still figure out the uh, computer programs by which people are able to pr process sentences. They can understand and produce sentences, uh, understand in quotes there, because uh, it's all syntactical. And furthermore, it can do a, do a computer theory of vision. Uh, we understand the computer programs by which they interpret the input stimuli, the symbols that come in, as being objects with certain shapes and sizes. Okay, so what should we say about cognitivism? All right, I want to stop for questions now. I'm going to uh, take a drink of water and make sure everybody's up with this. Yes? If a cognitivist it wants to suppose that you still study the mind in terms of syntax of global operations, yeah. uh, I mean, where does that leave uh, the motivation? Why, why do we even go through these processes? Isn't mm -hmm. that the realm of semantics, and isn't that very important? For yeah. OK. Now, this, uh, let me, good question. Let me repeat it. Uh, it looks like on this particular account, we've left out motivation. Why does anybody bother to give a damn about whether the ground is wet? Oh, what's the uh, driving force of the uh, motivation here? Two answers to that. One is, 
many of the processes in question are totally unconscious. Uh, when I utter these sentences, your brain automatically parses them into subjects and predicates. It automatically disambiguates structurally uh, ambiguous uh, sentences. We'll talk about that, about that a bit when we talk about uh, uh, the, uh, how the brain works. Uh, and similarly, when you see something, if as I look around this room, I don't have to think, do I want to see that as a guy with a blue sweater on? It just happens. I'm going to see that as a guy with a blue sweater on because the system is totally automatic. Now, it's true there are these oddball areas where you have to uh, consider motivation. Uh, but there, uh, you can do a, a second level program about the bottom level program. Uh, you have a motivating program that operates on the uh, low level cognitive program. I, uh, so <clears throat> you have a program that enables you to generate English sentences and interpret English sentences. But then you have a higher level program that says when you're in a bar and she looks awfully attractive, you produce these kinds of sentences and hope that she will produce these other kinds of sentences. So that's a motivating program about the uh, ground level program. I, 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 again, I'm a bit like Voltaire trying to explain the Catholic Church. I don't believe any of this stuff, but I'm telling you how these, uh, how these guys would answer a question like that. There are people who actually in this room who are actually knowledgeable uh, about these matters, and they can correct me if I make any egregious mistakes. Uh, okay, uh, other questions? Yeah, at the, near the back. I, and now I have to I take my, my chain and try to get close because my hearing isn't very good. Uh, well, <clears throat> epiphenomenalism is always a, a problem uh, for these guys, but the way that they, uh, they deal with that is to say, it's like any other computer. Does the computer program function causally? Yeah, the computer program is not epiphenomenal. And the reason it's not epiphenomenal, it's implemented in the hardware. So there is a causal mechanism in the hardware, and the causal mechanism enables the program to have a causal effect and there isn't any question that that really works. I mean, no, in fact, um, when you fly in an airplane, an awful lot of the flying is done by computers. And the computer just takes in uh, information from the various gauges and processes it. And then it uh, uh, sends out a set of instructions uh, to the machinery as to what it's supposed to do. And it keeps the airplane aloft. So you can uh, fly an airplane with a syntax. I, it happens all the time. How does it work? Well, here comes the magic word, transducers. The information comes in, and then it's encoded. Yeah, everybody knows what a transducer is. It's a device that converts one kind of energy into another kind of energy. So the loudspeaker converts electrical energy into sound energy. Uh, okay, so the, uh, uh, the uh, optical energy that comes into your eye is con on, on this vision of things is converted into the electrical uh, energy in the, uh, electrochemical energy in the visual system, and this in eventually uh, produces output behavior by more uh, transducers. Uh, okay, so that's that's their answer to that question. E Epiphenomenalism is not a problem for these guys. Now it is still a problem in philosophy, and I'm going to tell you why. Most of the people, I don't know if I'm going to say most, but an awful lot of the people who should know better, uh, when they see the falsity of materialism come out as epiphenomenalists. Uh, Dave Chalmers is an example of this. I forget if he's in the reading or not, but in any case, uh, he's an epiphenomenalist. He thinks, yes, the mind is not the same as the brain. You can't do a reduction, either type-type or token-token. So a dual, property dualism is right, but you pay the price of epiphenomenalism because, as uh, everybody likes to say, um, the, uh, the physical universe is causally closed, and you can't have anything, any mysterious non-physical entities coming in and acting. Uh, Dave once won 20 bucks uh, at a, at a, by making a bet. I gave a lecture on the mind-body problem, and somebody says, Searle is denying that the physical universe is causally closed. So Dave bet this guy 20 bucks that I was not denying uh, that. I, I think it's trivially true, but that means just consciousness is part of the physical universe for reasons I'll explain to you. Uh, anyway, so there's an easy $20 to be uh, made. It's, uh, it's easier than betting that uh, 
uh, uh, Reno is uh, uh, west of Los Angeles, which it is. That'll win you bets in, in a number of bars. Uh, that's irrelevant. Uh, that's a footnote to this particular discussion. Uh, okay, so now we're going to criticize cognitivism. Everybody's up to the rhetorical structure. Strong AI, I'm assuming strong AI has been refuted, but there's still an interesting version of the computational theory of the mind that I call cognitivism, and cognitivism uh, says all the same, the brain is a syntactical engine, and the semantics just goes along for the ride. I think Fodor believes that. I'm not sure if he still does, but last time I talked to him about this stuff, that's what he believed. Is okay, we'll give you the damn semantics. Uh, but the truth is, all the same, uh, the brain is a digital computer, and the, and the crucial cognitive processes are computational processes. What's wrong with that? Okay, let me make sure everybody's up with us. Questions about what I've said or any other uh, questions? Uh, okay, well, I'm going to give you a one-sentence refutation of cognitivism, and then we're going to go to that sheet of paper uh, that I've handed out, because I want to make sure we have time to discuss that. <clears throat> it's going to be kind of a long sentence, but here it goes. In the sciences, we're interested in discovering a phenomena that are observer-independent. Now, in an ordinary computer, of the kind that you buy in a store, there are lots of processes that are observer independent. Uh, there are the electronic state changes in the computer. Uh, there is uh, the voltage levels in the transistors. There are a number of oscillations in the uh, transistor and a whole lot of other stuff that I don't even begin to understand. But there are a whole lot of electric electrical and physical phenomena that are all observer independent. How about computation? Is computation observer relative or is it observer independent? And once you put the question that way, it seems to me the answer is obvious. Computation is observer relative. It's relative to the interpreter at the designer, the programmer, they attach the computational interpretation to the system. But computation does not name a fact of physics. It's the physics that enables us to use the system as a computer. It's the physics to which we attach the computational interpretation. But computation as a phenomenon is observer relative. It's only a computer because we've designed it and used it that way. Now, people think that if it's observer relative, then it must be totally arbitrary. Anything goes. No, that's not true. Uh, this object, I have a, a pocket full of observer relative objects. This is a knife. But it's being a knife is observer relative. We designed it for that purpose. If, we dis if these were only designed and used as paperweights, then it would stop being a knife and would become a paperweight. So that it's a knife is observer relative. All functions are observer relative. I, I won't bore you by showing you a whole lot of other observer relative physical. This one's rather sordid. Um, uh, observer relative physical systems, but knives and keys and combs are all observer relative physical systems. But it doesn't mean they're arbitrary. Not anything can function as a knife or a comb or a key. Now, similarly, with a computer. But, and this is the important, what we're looking for in cognitive science is a natural science of cognition. But the computational interpretation is not in the physics. It's not in natural science. Computation is an observer relative phenomenon. Now I'm going to come back to that. I promised you one sentence. It turned out to be more like a whole paragraph or maybe the beginning of an article. Now I want to go to that sheet of paper you have in front of you. Has everybody got one of these or can look on with somebody? Um, now one of the things uh, that is uh, fun about the present era is that there are certain obvious mistakes uh, that are made every day on uh, television and in newspapers and in popular culture, even among educated people. 
these are mistakes that you're not going to make. <clears throat> uh, let's go through them. Consider the, this old chestnut of a question. Could a machine think? Now, when you hear that question, you naturally think in terms of the traditional categories. You think, ah, machines, like a car engine or a generator or uh, maybe a big diesel engine in a boat. Could such a machine think? Always ask yourself, what do these guys mean? If by a machine we mean any physical system capable of performing certain functions, then, of course, the human brain is a machine. Uh, so is the liver and the heart. They're all machines, indeed. The human being is a machine, a complex machine to be sure, and maybe more than just a machine, but all the same, it is a machine. So the answer is, of course, a machine can think uh, because we're all machines and we can all think. But how about an artifact? How about a man-made uh, machine? Uh, well, we know that the brain does it causally. It's a series of causal mechanisms. And if you can duplicate the causes, you could duplicate the effects. So if you made a machine identical to me, as philosophers love to say, molecule for molecule, you made a machine just like me, then that machine would have the same causal powers that I do. So we ought to hear the question, can you make an artificial system uh, that is conscious, the way we hear the question, can you make an artificial system that pumps blood uh, like the heart? And we know that you can do that with a heart because we know how the heart works and you can now buy an artificial heart. Why don't we do it with a brain? Well, the short answer is we don't know how the brain works. Because we don't know how the brain works, we don't know how to make an artificial brain. But I don't think there's any obstacle in principle. There's no philosophical obstacle to building a machine that was conscious, building an artificial machine. Just we haven't the faintest idea how to do it because we don't know how the brain does it. We have various theories about how it uh, does it, but they're pretty primitive. And I have to tell you, progress is depressingly slow. Uh, we know a lot more about the brain than we did 30 years ago when I first got interested in, well, more than 30 years, I guess. Anyway, when I first got interested in this stuff. But we still don't know how the brain works to produce consciousness. We're getting better. I mean, we know, we understand the effects of drugs. We know which neurotransmitters are, are interfered with if you take uh, cocaine or, or whatever. And we're even figuring out alcohol. Alcohol turned out to be harder. Uh, than people thought it was going to be. But we, we're starting to understand the neurobiology of uh, certain kinds of, of uh, chemicals. But the basic question, how the hell does this thing produce consciousness? Uh, we still don't know the answer to that. So we're not in a position to make an artificial machine. But the question, can you make an artificial machine that's conscious? We ought to hear like the question, can you make an artificial machine that pumps blood like a heart? I don't think there's any difficulty in principle. OK, third question. But could you make such a machine out of something other than neurons? Well, once again, we don't know the answer to that, because we don't know what is specific about the neurons that does it. Is it the specific electrochemical features, or is it the uh, rates of neuron firings relative to specific neuronal architectures? There are a lot of different theories out there. And the truth is, uh, we're still in a very backward state of the science of consciousness. However, there is an interesting result, and that is from the fact that brains do it causally, it follows that any artifact would have to duplicate the threshold causal powers of the brain to cause consciousness. It wouldn't be enough to simulate them. You couldn't just do it by doing a picture of it the way a computer does or a model. But you actually have to duplicate the causal powers. Now look, it's like, it's like the following. If you want to make an airplane, you don't have to use feathers uh, the way birds do. You don't have to use feathers to make a flying machine. But you do have to duplicate the causal power that the bird has to overcome the force of gravity in the Earth's atmosphere. That's what birds do. With Bernoulli's principle, they flap their wings 
and they overcome the force of gravity. Now, if you're going to do it with an airplane, you don't flap the wings, but you use Bernoulli's principle, and you get variable airflow over the wing, and that gets a, a, a thrust. You get up in the air. You duplicate and don't just simulate the causal power that the bird has to overcome the force of gravity. Now, similarly, if you're going to build an artificial thinking brain, you have to duplicate and not just simulate uh, the causal power that the brain has to do it. And we don't know uh, how the brain does it, uh, but we do know that it's a causal mechanism. And the question, can you do it in some other substance, we have to leave that open. We don't know uh, what the specific chemistry is. I mean, we know the specific chemistry of photosynthesis, so you know that you've got to produce certain kind of chemical compound if you're going to do photosynthesis. What exactly do you produce by way of the electrochemistry when you produce consciousness? I think that is one of them. I, I think that is, frankly, the most exciting question in the sciences today. Yes, I'll give you string theory and quantum mechanics. They're terrific stuff. But I would like to know how the hell does the brain do it? And we are, uh, we're, we're not close uh, to answering that question. Uh, there, one of the um, supplementary readings of this course is a little book called I wrote called The Mystery of Consciousness, in which I review a whole lot of efforts to solve the problem of consciousness. And why is it so hard? Well, I'm not sure. I, I, I am in touch with these guys who do the work, and one of them who died not so long ago was Francis Crick. And Francis was a very smart guy, and he once said to me, look, it's much harder solving the problem of consciousness than it was figuring out DNA. He discovered DNA. And I had to burst out laughing because I said, you know, Francis, we've been doing, trying to figure out consciousness for about 2,500 years. Of course, it's going to be tougher uh, than DNA. But uh, at one point, he thought, well, it's just variable rates of neuron firings in the thalamocortical system. It's, it's uh, uh, neuron firings in the range of 40 to 70 hertz between the thalamus and layers four and six of the cortex. Well, that didn't work. Um, you get 40 hertz, you get firing a 40 hertz in the retina. So that it's going to be, whatever it is, that's not going to be the answer. But what is the answer? I don't know. There are lots of uh, theories. I just reviewed a book for the New York Review, and I should probably put that review. I guess I can't do it till they publish it, but I'll, I'll try to get you that review. There's a smart guy in San Diego. Actually, is he in San Diego? Uh, his name is Antonio Damasio. Uh, and he's just published a book uh, called... Um, it's something got the self in the title. What's the title of Antonio's book? God, I got what's his name's disease. Antonio wrote a book called The Self. Uh, the Self Comes to Mind. That's the title. The Self Comes to Mind. Uh, and he uh, tries to solve the problem of consciousness uh, by saying, well, the brain produces the self and the brain produces the mind. And when they come together, consciousness emerges. Well, it's a nice theory. doesn't work. But anyway, uh, uh, but some theories not got to work. If, if those guys' theories don't work, there has to be some theory. We know the brain does it, so we ought to be able to figure out how it does it. Okay, where are we? Question four. What about computers? Could a computer think? If computer means anything that computes, then all humans are computers because they can all compute. So, of course, a computer can think. Indeed, anything can be described computationally. You can always, I mean, I told you, you can always say, this is a very simple digital computer. It has a one-step program. The program says, stay there. And I, given the standard textbook account of computation, those guys have no answer to that. Now, they, I think there's a smarter answer to that. I'll tell you about it in a minute. But in any case, on the standard definitions, anything can be described computationally. So under some description or other, everything is a computer. Anything that can think has to be a computer, because under, under some description or other, or other, everything is a computer. I think the way out of that is to say, the sequence of zeros and ones in the Turing machine must not just be anything that you can call a zero or call a one. So I could let this be a zero and this be a one, and now I have a computer with two symbols. Uh, you would have to say, no, look, there has to be a certain kind of causal relationship 
between the zeros and ones, between the, but the way that they're implemented in the system. However, uh, the point remains, and that is computation names an observer relative phenomenon, and you can attach a computational interpretation to anything that can think. So, of course, something can be both a computer and uh, can think. Okay, now none of those questions are the ones that really bother us. The question that really bothers us is this one. Could, and this were up to question six, could something think solely in virtue of computing? Is computation by itself sufficient for or constitutive of thinking? That's the question. Uh, it's not can a computer think, can a machine think, can an artifact think? It is, is computation by itself constitutive of thinking? Is it sufficient for or constitutive of thinking? And the answer to that is no. And by now, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to read you what I've told you so many times, but it is that the computation is defined syntactically, and the syntax alone is not sufficient uh, for the semantics or mental content of actual thinking. Now, I put in a, a final paragraph here uh, and that is that computation doesn't name an observer independent, a natural process like thinking or digestion. Rather, computation is observer relative. It's relative to the assignment of a computational interpretation. Here's the irony of this. When I first started attacking uh, uh, this model, people said, oh God, here's some philosopher who thinks we're all spiritual and, uh, and the, um, it doesn't want to think that machines uh, like computers could think. It's exactly the opposite. The problem is not that the computer is too much of a machine for it to think. It's not enough of a machine. Why? The actual computer that you buy in a store is indeed a machine. It's got energy transfers that define its operations. But computation does not name a machine process. Computation names an abstract mathematical process that we have found ways to implement on physical machines. But now this is a very important point. In a way that digestion or internal combustion or the operation of a wind turbine, those are all machine processes. They are defined by energy transfer. In internal combustion, you convert uh, the, the, uh, the potential energy in the hydrocarbon molecule by oxidizing it, you convert it into heat energy. That's what machines do. They convert energy into energy. There's an energy transfer. Computation is not defined in terms of energy transfer. It's defined as an abstract mathematical program. So the mathematical process is implemented in machines but it's not a machine process. Now it seems to me, from everything we know about how the world works, thinking is a machine process. This is a process that goes on in this machine. We don't know the nature of the energy transfer. We now think that it's got some special relation with the thalamocortical system, with the thalamus and the cortex, but we're still struggling to get exactly the machine processes that define Thinking. Thinking is a machine process. Computation is not. Uh, okay, now I've said a lot, and I, 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 know I want it to sink in, but let's take questions, because I, 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 I want to make sure everybody's up with this. Yes, you had your hand up. Yeah. 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 No, that's right. This, let me repeat this argument because it's one I often get. Um, I did everybody at the back. Well, I'm, I'm going to repeat it. And you tell me, look, I, you admit that we don't know how brains work. Uh, and we do know how computers work. So why couldn't it turn out that the brain was a computer? That the way the brain works is uh, as a, 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 like a computer. Uh, the answer to that I can give quite simply. And that is, it's true that we don't know how the brain works, but we know this much. It produces semantic content. It, produce, it causally produces thoughts and uh, feelings uh, and uh, conscious states and intentional states, both conscious and unconscious. Now, 
we know that a system that has only got a syntax can't uh, be enough for that because the syntax by itself, just the syntax, uh, is not by itself enough for the semantic content. Now, of course, a brain might be a computer in the sense that anything is a computer. And it might be a computer uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the certain essential processes that we go through, uh, such as, for example, doing addition and long division. But the question, is that sufficient for thinking? Is that sufficient for mental content? And the answer to that has to be no, for the reasons I've been repeating over and over. It's syntactical. You see, here's the point. I can't prove to you that, let's say, uh, this thing isn't conscious. Uh, I'm pretty sure it isn't conscious. Uh, um, but for all I know, for all I can prove to you, maybe it's thinking, I wish that guy would wash me more often so I wouldn't get all that dirt on my main blade. I don't think for a moment it's thinking that, but that's not uh, my aim as a philosopher to prove that. What I'm trying to show you is whatever it is that produces consciousness, just manipulating formal symbols isn't going to be enough. It might be a, as a byproduct. It might be uh, that the I mean, I drive a car of a kind that most owners attribute mental states to. Uh, they fall in love with 9-11, and the fact that 9-11 has now a, a got these ghastly associations because of association with terrorism, 9-11 owners just love that. They don't mind the terrorist association. I'm deeply convinced that if God drives a car, she probably drives a Volvo station wagon. But if the devil drives a car, it's probably a 9-11. It's probably a, okay. Now, people do attribute all these dumb mental states to their cars, and I'm as guilty of that as the next idiot. But I don't seriously believe I, that the Porsche engine is busy producing consciousness. However, if it does, that's a byproduct. What we're interested in is how does the system work? Now, similarly, if it turns out uh, Apple owners have their love for apples the way I do for the 9-11, and for all I know, God might attach consciousness to every uh, Apple computer. I don't think it's likely. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the computational process by itself sufficient for or constitutive of thinking? And we know the answer to that question is no, for the reasons I keep saying over and over, namely, the syntax of the program isn't sufficient for semantics. Okay, well, let's go on and talk about another uh, subject. I don't want to spend all day on computers, and as usual, I leave myself enough time at the end. Uh, there are a couple of views that I have not yet mentioned uh, that I should at least uh, I mentioned in passing, uh, and one is panpsychism. Now, I, I don't know how anybody I can take panpsychism seriously, but there are a couple of famous philosophers who have uh, adopted it. Uh, Nagel once flirted with it at one, ki one time. Now he's it doesn't actually believe it. I've asked him about this. And Dave Chalmers, I, I think, embraced it at one time. And uh, I saw him on a, on a, uh, a computer vi video thing where he was endorsing it. It's not a serious view, but let me tell you what it is. According to panpsychism, everything is conscious. The reason that brains can be conscious uh, is that everything is conscious. And what happens in brains is all the little bitty consciousness that you have in uh, subatomic particles gets together in the right way so that we, we can be self-conscious. We can have a larger human consciousness and not just have the mini consciousness uh, that everything has. And at one point, uh, Chalmers, in a book that he wrote that I reviewed, imagines uh, a, a conscious thermostat. Uh, what is it like to be a thermostat? Uh, ask Chalmers. I'm sorry, I, I, I think this is ridiculous, but anyway, I, I, I'm supposed to tell you what other people think and not just what I think. So here's what other people think. Chalmers says, what is it like to be a thermostat? Nagel wants to know what it's like to be a bat. Well, that's probably easy. The tough one is, what's it like <laughs> to be a thermostat? And Dave said, well, it's kind of all gray on gray. It's not a very exciting life that the thermostat has. Um, okay, I don't take this seriously. Why not? Well, very simply, uh, the theory is not coherent 
consciousness has a remarkable trait in that it comes in discrete units. My consciousness is not part of a great big puddle of consciousness of which your consciousness is another part. My consciousness is different from anybody else's consciousness, and that's because every conscious field is unified. You only have an experience as part of a unified conscious state. Now, if you're going to say that everything is conscious, how do you identify the units? If you say the uh, thermostat is conscious, then what about each screw in the thermostat? Is that also conscious? Is that the part of the same consciousness of, as the whole thermostat? Or is it a separate consciousness? And if the, if the screw is conscious, how about each molecule in the screw? Consciousness comes to us in unified conscious fields. And if you're going to say everything is conscious, you have to tell us what are the principles by which the conscious fields are individuated. How do you identify one conscious field from another conscious field? And there's no answer to that. So panpsychism does not seem to me... I, it isn't just a false theory. It's not a coherent theory. You can't state it... Uh, coherently. Now, maybe you could do it as a kind of absolute idealism. You could say, no, the whole universe is one single great big consciousness, that God is all of the consciousness of the universe. And the, and the, uh, uh, the uh, Hegelian idealists call this the absolute. But that's not the same as absolute idealism is not the same as panpsychism. Panpsychism said, no, consciousness is everywhere. It's spread over the universe like jam on bread. It's just sort of icky consciousness everywhere. That won't work because consciousness always comes in unified fields. I don't just hear the sound of my voice, but I hear the sound of my voice uh, together with a slight headache left over from the Cabernet Sauvignon uh, and the pr feeling of my shoes, my body against my shoes and the collar against my neck and my dim awareness of running out of time and I'm only halfway through the lecture so I, be, I better start talking faster. All of those occur as part of one single unified conscious field and that's how consciousness comes. It comes in unified fields. This, by the way, is why the split brain experiments are so important to us in philosophy because it looks like in those experiments the guy's got two consciousnesses in there. There are two guys in his head. Let me tell you about those experiments. Uh, these were originally done by a, a guy named Roger Sperry, who was a very great scientist, and his uh, student, Mike Gazaniga, uh, has also done a lot of these experiments. Let me give you the simplest experiment. Uh, you have people who suffer terrible epilepsy. I, and they suffer uh, uh, this awful epilepsy and that no standard cure works. So to cure the epilepsy, they did something they should have never been allowed to do and it's not allowed anymore. They cut the corpus callosum that connects the two halves of the brain. It's a big lump of tissue that connects the two hemispheres. It's called a corpus callosum and the operation is called a, a commiserotomy and they simply cut it in half. They cut the guy's brain in half. Now the result is that the co communication between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere is severely Im impaired. Here's a typical experiment. You hold up a watch and you hold it up so that the right side of the brain can see it but the left side of the brain cannot. Language is on the left side. You ask the guy, what do you see? And with his left side, which is where his language is, he says, he says, I don't see anything. And then with his left hand, which is controlled by the right side of his brain, he reaches out and grabs the watch. Does everybody get the picture? He has no consciousness where the language is of seeing a watch, but he where, the, where, the, where there is no language, he can see the watch there, and so he uses his left hand, controlled by the right brain, to grab the watch. Now, there's a whole lot of experiments like that, and we'll talk about their significance later. But what they suggest is two consciousnesses in there. Normally, they coalesce because it's uh, healthy, but not always. We have now run out of time, and you get to hand in those...